and welcome to the Self-Made Map. This is episode eight entitled Hot Dog Stand. You'll get it by the end, I assure you. Uh, before we get started tonight, uh, as always, thank you to Pat and Keyshawn for uh, helping me get this up and running on the uh, Coalition Radio Network. And if you haven't already done so, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you finding if you are finding content that you enjoy or find interesting, share it with a friend, ask them to subscribe as well. And, um, and there's also merch, as you can see. So I've got my uh, Coalition t-shirt on today. Uh, very, very soon, based on the weather, it's going to be time for short sleeve shirts. So I will be stocking up on that. Although black t-shirts in the summertime sometimes aren't the most uh, comfortable. But uh, be that as it may, it's a great looking shirt and it helps uh, support the kind of real-time coverage that you're not getting uh, from some of the local uh, larger media news outlets, right? So there's only one news organization in the state that I'm aware of that I've seen that is consistently sending uh, a camera and a microphone out to some of these school committee meetings where you know, important issues are being decided and it might be Barrington this week or this month, um, but it could be your district or your community next month or the month after that. So uh, seeing what is going on in the schools, around the schools, and how uh, various school committees in the state are addressing those issues is a great education. And Pat does a great job because Pat just turns on the camera, turns on the mic, and lets the story unfold uh, right before your eyes. So longer form videos, um, but you get all the detail and um, none of the kind of prepackaged um, heavily processed stuff that you're getting on uh, some of the larger news outlets that are maybe giving 90 seconds or two minutes of coverage to some of this stuff. So with that said, please uh, hit the subscribe button, uh, throw some thumbs around, hopefully thumbs up. Uh, if you're not throwing thumbs ups, then uh, by all means leave a comment as to what is missing or what could be better. And with that, I will kick off tonight's episode with, as you're all expecting, hey Rich, how are things going? in the nickel markets these days? And it's a really short, simple, easy answer. Uh, the London Market Exchange has not been trading nickel for a week now because they're trying to untangle a very large, uh, not necessarily complicated, uh, but a very large derivatives deal that, uh, that blew up. And at some point when it's all over and we know what happened, or at least there's an official story as to what happened and why it happened and how it happened, I think it'll be a great episode. So we'll, we'll jump on that. But for right now, it's being untangled. It involves a, a Chinese billionaire, JP Morgan, $8 billion, and a uh, position that cannot be covered. So uh, we'll leave it at that for now. And like I said, we'll do a kind of a deep dive into it because I think once the whole story comes out and how it happened, it's going to be uh, it's going to be one of those historical, fascinating uh, stories about how the financial system almost came to an end. So with that, that's nickel for right now. Uh, in other news tonight, our topic is going to be kind of a scared straight episode for parents. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I was doing. And in fact, I'm going to show you a little bit of what I was doing when I was a junior in high school for math class, and then kind of explain how that happened and how it didn't happen overnight. And some of the things that you might want to be thinking about as a parent, if you're noticing similar patterns with your children as the one that I went through. So with that, let's start off by uh, bringing up a video, a quick video that I made. It's about 90 seconds. And uh, this is where the episode for this evening gets its title. Uh, we're going to watch Hot Dog Stand. And then I'll explain what we were doing at that point. So this was a computer game. And I'll uh, let the content speak for itself. Welcome to the hot dog stand, the works. 
In order to cut the mustard, you have to be prepared for each event in the arena and stay informed so you'll be top dog. Before each event, get off to a good start by going to the desk to check your to-do list and your calendar. Then tune into the TV for the day's weather and any special news reports. Check the bulletin board to find out how many people the arena can hold for different events. Read announcements from the arena management and see your inventory. Stock up on supplies for the stand by ordering from your supplier folder located in the file cabinet. Enter the quantities you want on the order form and pay by check. Set your prices on the today's special sign. Use your checkbook and franchise report on the computer to keep track of your costs and profits. When you are ready for business, go to the hot dog stand. If you manage your office well, sales will sizzle when you open the stand, and your profits for this season will be tasty. All right, so let's uh, let's hop out of the screen share here and come back and explain what it is you just saw because it was uh, it was something to behold for sure. So that was a more recent version of a game that I played about 10 years earlier. So that was the 1996 version. Uh, I was a junior in high school in 1988. So um, obviously graphics and computer technology in general had moved forward quite a bit in those eight years, but that's a game called Hot Dog Stand. And what you just saw should terrify you as a parent, particularly if your child is uh, struggling with math uh, at an early age um, and still has plenty of time to correct it. So that was my life for an entire semester in my junior year of high school. And I got full credit for math for that. And again, to kind of set the context, we were probably talking 1988. So we were still steeped in the Cold War. We were about seven years removed from President Ronald Reagan's um, A Nation at Risk uh, report where uh, the Department of Education for the United States had um, gone through and assessed America's uh, math and science capabilities and, and how education was being performed and the results that were being achieved in those areas. And there I was in 1988, just seven years later, uh, playing a game called Hot Dog Stand. So what exactly was Hot Dog Stand? We would go in, we would boot up our machines and we would load the game. And then basically you're operating a hot dog stand as the name would imply, not a tough one to figure out. Um, but you had to order product. So hot dogs, as the name would imply, hot dog buns, of course, uh, soda and chips, as I recall. I did this probably... 500 times over the course of the semester. So I have some pretty, pretty sharp memories of it. And, you know, depending on a weather forecast and the type of event that was coming, you would order all of your product. And then, you know, there were probabilities associated with the weather and, you know, the, the anticipated crowd size. And basically you're trying to maximize your profits. So sell as many hot dogs, sell as many, much soda as you could. Price was your, your lever. So if you overpriced hot dogs, you wouldn't sell as many. If you underpriced them, you'd sell plenty, but you wouldn't make enough to cover your costs. And um, then at the end of a particular week, uh, if you had leftover hot dogs and buns, those went in the trash and that was kind of a cost uh, that you incurred and there was no salvage on it. And then chips and soda, you got to carry into the next week. So you got to manage your inventory. Probably interesting for, you know, maybe a day, maybe two, you know, I think class periods at that point were about 45, 50 minutes a piece. So, you know, maybe you would do that for a day or two and say, okay, this is interesting, but I did it for like 14 weeks. And um, as I said, got full, um, full math credit for that. Now you might be asking yourself, well, geez, um, A, how did you get there? And I will tell you that you don't get there overnight. Uh, it's a long process. It took me about nine years to work myself into that math hole, but we'll get to that in a minute. The bigger question is, where were my parents during all of this? And how did they not know that this was going on? And, you know, just how little uh, learning, I mean, there's you know, plenty of bad puns in there about hot dogs, but uh, not, not a whole lot of math going on, you know, after about 45 minutes of practice. And so the reason my parents didn't actually grasp the gravity of the situation 
was that they were under the impression, rightly, that I was taking a class called Computer Math Applications. And if you think about it, that's an accurate title for the class, although it doesn't do justice to the level of drudgery that it involved and just how little education uh, that, it, that it entailed. But it was a game and games are a type of application and it was involved some math because you had inventories and um, you know, adding and subtracting costs and, uh, and revenue. And, um, and it was done on a computer. So computer math application, that was great. So my parents thought I was getting some cutting edge uh, computer education when in reality I was playing a really um, basic video game. Again, I go back to for 14 weeks and I'll never forget because I saw it for 14 weeks, the teacher for this class, you know, it obviously was someone in the math department. She had a variety of other classes that she taught throughout the day, but this was a period where she walked in, took attendance, sat down at her desk at the front of the room and read the newspaper. And then we would go up, you know, with maybe 10 minutes left in class and report our best score of the day and, and give her a printout of our best score of the day. And that was pretty much it. Uh, at some point, somebody uh, in the math department, maybe her, uh, would staple those onto a bulletin board, you know, so you knew who the, who the leaders were and who the best were um, at selling hot dogs and soda on, uh, on the game. But that, that was it. And so she, that was probably the, the easiest money anybody has ever made. She got paid, you know, for 45 minutes of her salary every day, um, you know, to read the paper and do occasionally a little bit of staple work. But um, yeah, it was quite a, a little bit of a con job there. And um, I think my parents probably deserve a, a partial refund on their property taxes from, from the 1980s based on that. But so that was hot dog stand. Um, not much was learned in that experience. And again, the, question, the other question that most people would have is how, you know, how in the world did you end up there? And you, know, you got to work pretty hard at not working at all uh, over a very long period of time in order to get yourself into that situation. So I've told the story before about how I struggled in first grade with um, subtraction problems that involved what was then called borrowing. If you're a common core family, you now call it unbundling. Uh, but basically problems like 26 minus nine, where you have to um, you know, take a 10 out of the tens place and, and convert it into 10 ones so that you have 19 minus six. And then you bring down your, um, your, remaining, your remaining 10 from the tens column. Uh, so I struggled with that in first grade. It took longer than it should have, I guess, to figure out, although I was so wigged out by the fact that I kept getting you know, these papers that were full of red ink and X's and, and kind of angry X's at that from my first grade teacher um, that you know, I got labeled as not good at math. But, you know, saving grace, he's really, you know, really good reading comprehension, very articulate, uh, but not good at math. And that's okay because, you know, most kids don't excel at both. So it's one or the other, uh, which is, you know, another kind of bad assumption that got uh, worked in there. But, you know, my parents bought it hook, line, and sinker. That was the story that we went with. And so as I moved through elementary school, um, we grouped for math. And you had the high group and you had the low group and then you had everybody else and the everybody else didn't even have a name. It wasn't like the middle group or the average group. It was just, you know, math group. Um, but everybody knew, knew who was in the high group. Everybody knew who was in the low group. Uh, the high kids clearly either had, you know, uh, some sort of natural aptitude for math and therefore were able to get through and, and master the concepts more quickly. So they got to go further so they didn't get bored. Um, and then, you know, the low group, uh, frequently it was, and again, learning disabilities were not as well understood, you know, in the 80s. So uh, there's a combination of uh, behavioral issues and, and learning disabilities. Um, and so everybody else was kind of stuck in the middle. So if you think about where the resources went, well, they went to the high achievers uh, in order to keep them focused and um, uh, engaged in the class. And then you know, obviously the, the ones that needed the extra help, you know, got the extra time. And then you had these people uh, like me that were in the middle and that group 
you know, on its own, it's just kind of like everybody else. Well, so you're going to have some people that are borderline, you know, high achievers, you know, that maybe you're just off of, uh, off the pace to get into the high group. And then you've got some others that are just barely above, you know, uh, you know, where the low group is. And so when you've got that much disparity, uh, particularly with some of the people, you know, who are closer to the low group or who just may not be as motivated like me, or just believe they weren't particularly good at math like me, then things tend to slow down even more. So you're not really even average at that point. You've kind of got this group of everybody else who are, you're kind of managing to the lowest common denominator. So you're really driven by what the, the lowest tier of that everybody else group can do. And as that happens year after year, kids fall further behind. Some of them will um, progress out of that, you know, out of the everybody else group and go to the high group. Um, others will, you know, be resorted into the low group. Um, but most of us just kind of continually follow along uh, and move at the pace that's given to us. And that's usually there to accommodate um, the, the slower, you know, the slowest uh, progressing students in the group. And so you compound that over nine years. So second through ninth grade, and I guess we'll take a stop at the end of elementary school, but second through sixth grade. And all of a sudden, you know, a lot of time has been lost and a lot of instruction has not happened and a lot of skills have not been mastered. And somewhere along the line, uh, it ceased to be a priority with the student, that would have been me. Uh, the parents have accepted it as a given that it's, you know, just not something that's ever likely to happen, but, you know, other things are going well. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll focus on the positive. And, you know, the school system has done its sorting work and kind of puts you into track that gets you out the other end at the end of the school year, which is to say moving on to the next grade. Um, when I got to sixth grade, we all kind of figured that, you know, I would be in the everybody else group, but there was a twist. And uh, in preparation for junior high school, which started in seventh grade, um, there was some a more a finer grouping of math students. And my math skills based on my testing and what everybody knew about me in the school, my prior teachers, you know, feedback was that I really did not belong in the higher average group. I should have been in a, you know, more, if not the low group, not the low group, but, um, you know, I was one of those people that wasn't doing a heck of a lot and kind of slowing the average group down over the years. And so that would have been fine, except that I was being tracked for college prep in junior high school. And in order to get into that track, I needed to be in a certain level of math proficiency. So um, I needed to be in a higher math group than I was really capable of being in at that point. And so after much discussion, we assured ourselves that, you know, we would, it, math would automatically fix itself for rich. And so I was put into a higher college prep math group in sixth grade, um, which really put me behind the eight ball because I wasn't anywhere near ready to be in that group. And so I kind of just checked out. I was, you know, sixth grader, so maybe 10, 11 years old and um, just, you know, not somebody who was putting forth a lot of effort, wasn't getting a lot of pressure at home to, to figure this stuff out. Uh, so I wasn't doing homework, wasn't doing well on tests, and um, apparently not paying particularly good attention in class either. Um, and so, understandably, my sixth grade math teacher was not a fan of mine. And um, when it came time for report cards, you know, she kind of kind of let loose, and I had to go home with a D that uh, was not well received by my parents. So. Again, another lost year in sixth grade really was a, a lost year just because my attitude coupled with the fact that I was already so far behind that I was in a class that I couldn't, shouldn't be in. Um, and that kind of set me uh, right into, into junior high school. And so there's this repeating pattern of, you know, being grouped low, so low expect, lower expectations, and then, you know, kind of self fulfilling prophecy. Oh, he's not going to do well at math. Well, guess what? Doesn't do well at math. Um, and then all of a sudden you're a junior in high school, you're driving a car, you're a year and a half away from going out into the world and you have no math fundamentals whatsoever. And that is a very, you know, 
it's a tough place to be. And, you know, from the school's perspective, this is someone who, um, you know, just didn't accomplish, you know, was, was very unbalanced, did very well in certain subjects, but, you know, didn't master the math and therefore got none of the math. And um, for someone who wanted to go on to college, that was going to be a problem because you were missing a major, uh, major set of tools in your, in your box. Um, but they got to graduate me. And so the way that we can graduate you is to put you into this computer math applications class and sentence you to 14 weeks of, of playing hot dog stand uh, in order to, you know, to get a grade. And I don't even know that I got a top grade in that class. I think I probably got like a B. Um, but that's how you end up there. And that's the school's perspective. Like I said, their job is to get you from grade to grade. Um, if that means lowering the standards a little bit, then we can do that. If that means lightening the workload, even though you're not going to get necessarily all of the skills that you will need or should be able to get under the right circumstances. And then, you know, as you get that close to graduation, there's no course correction at that point. We're not going to catch up nine months of or nine years of missed math opportunities, um, you know, in 14 weeks. So off to uh, hot dog stand or computer math applications, you go. Um, you know, from my perspective, like I said, it, you know, math ceased to be a priority very early on. Nobody was actually expecting me to do well. So um, I was, you know, in my mind, my, you know, undeveloped youth, youthful mind, I was, I was meeting expectations. So all was well there. And, um, you know, I think parents in those, in that era, and, and certainly all the time, I mean, parents never want to you know, jump up and down and admit that something about their child is anything less than perfect. Um, but I think, you know, for my parents, it was much easier to um, accentuate the positive and, you know, kind of grin and bear the negative, whatever, you know, whatever that might cost down the road. And so that is how you end up in computer math applications, aka hot dog stand for 14 weeks. Um, I think I took a computer programming class the rest of that year, and then uh, so again, pretty pretty basic stuff, and we were programming in the basic language. And um, I don't even think I took a math class in in my senior year of high school. I think I I wasn't required to, and therefore I met expectations and and chose not to not to do it. Um, and that would cost me later on in college, and I'll talk about that in a in a future episode. The message that I have for parents in this, you know, in this episode, based on that story is, number one, if your child is struggling with math, um, you know, stay on top of it, figure out what the problem is. Is it a learning, you know, is it an issue with learning? Is it an issue with the way things are being taught? But there's a lot of different ways to teach and learn math. And so if what's happening in your child's classroom isn't necessarily, you know, the best fit for them, find something that is. And, you know, if that's outside of school and, you know, it's a tutor or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be, um, you know, absolutely do that because you, you don't want this thing to fester. And you also don't want to lull yourself into complacency by believing, oh, well, little Johnny or little Janie is getting, you know, C's and C pluses and maybe some B minuses and B's in math. Um, but they're in, you know, they're not in the high group, but they're in the average group. And, you know, that's good enough. It's probably not because like I said, where the pace is being set is by the slowest movers in that group. And so if you're benchmarking, your child is, you know, proficient enough in that group, but you're benchmarking it against a set of, you know, not top performers, they're probably not getting enough. So the report card looks fine. The, you know, the letter on the report card is fine, but in, in reality, they're not getting everything that they need uh, and that they will need in future, future math classes. And that's going to create a situation where either they have to, you know, kind of come clean at some point and admit uh, that there are things that they need to go back and learn uh, or progress through without any kind of a math background, which is going to limit uh, their future you know, career opportunities, because so much of what we do now is um, quantitative, even if we're using, you know, computers to 
you know, do some of the, the raw calculation work, the ability to reason, the ability to understand how problems are structured and how solutions are structured uh, mathematically is just uh, uh, an entry level skill at this point in my mind for, for really good, um, good jobs with great, you know, great future prospects. So um, there's an element as a parent of being honest with yourself about, you know, your child's progress. And, you know, if it's not going well, really committing yourself to figuring out how to fix it. And it can be fixed. My issues could have been fixed. It just, you know, they, they just weren't, it didn't happen until much later in life for me. Um, and, you know, it's kind of self-initiated because the job market uh, required it. Um, so, you know, getting ahead of it early, uh, you can, you know, this is one of those things that you absolutely positively want to nip at the bud. And if your child is getting A's and B's in math and testing well at the state level, uh, also still worth figuring out where they stand on the, on the wider stage nationally and globally. Um, because, you know, as we know, and it's in the, in the headlines every time uh, state testing results come out, the state hasn't tested that well in math. And so, again, if you're in a group, if you're at the top of a group of poor performers, you're still in a group of poor performers. And so, you know, you wanna find a better group, uh, a stronger group to, to benchmark against. And again, the more math that they can learn, the more that they can master, um, the better off that they're going to be. And that's going to keep them out of uh, hot dog stand, AKA computer math applications. So that is my advice. Um, would love questions or comments on this. Uh, I certainly have a lot to, um, to say on the topic. Uh, as someone who struggled throughout my entire career, nobody has more sympathy for uh, an encouragement for a kid who's struggling with math than I do based on, on my experiences. So um, leave a comment, leave a question, uh, you know, reach out and we can even schedule, schedule time to talk through you know, what's going on uh, with your kid's math progress. But um, yeah, don't give up on it and, and don't think that it's, it's not important because it's, it's super important. So I'm going to leave it there for tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next week on the self-made math when hopefully the world nickel market or at least the London metals exchange market for nickel will be open and we'll have some, uh, have a really good story about uh, what exactly happened there and what brought the world nickel market to its knees for a week. Until then, see you next time. Thanks.